it was my young black neighbors and my young black neighbors in Bed-Stuy and in Harlem and Tremont and young Puerto Rican and Dominican men in upper Manhattan and the Bronx who had the most to fear and the most likelihood of, of being victims of violence. Um, today, I like to have my grad students read that coined the phrase super predator. Um, they predicted that there would be a massive, horrific crime wave in American cities. As a growing number of young black men grew up, they were the children of the baby boom, and they were becoming young violent men, and it was going to transform our cities into a nightmare. Now it was sort of a quasi-academic precursor to the propaganda we now can hear on Fox News on a regular basis. But as it turned out, they were so wrong with their predictions that it was almost laughable. By 2004, there were fewer than 600 murders in the city. Only 25% were black. So truth is, those proportions haven't changed much since, since the crime wave of the crack era in the 80s and early 90s. So, you know, white people have their own ways of perpetrating violence, and I would not say that this is entirely a racial and ethnic issue, but it's important that we talk about it, about the reality of who's most affected in New York City's neighborhood. So what do we do about it? And that's the discussion today. What do we do about youth violence? What do we do about the various forms of what's called gangs? But as we'll hear today, it's not necessarily the same thing as gangs, what gangs mean in LA. Gangs in New York are very different. So we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about the question of police and community relations and the relationship between police and young people in New York, which we all know is no, uh, no simple, easy thing to discuss. Um, this week, our, our reporter Abigail Kramer from the Center, who works with me on Child Welfare Watch, is reporting a story about tenants in the New York City Housing Authority. And to no surprise, she's finding this generational split in public housing in New York between young people who feel consistently endlessly harassed by police and older residents who feel safer with the presence of police. So the split is not just between young people and police, there is division within the community as well about the role of police. So that tension's real, even as crime is down, stop and frisks are up, and lots of young people don't know who to trust when it comes to the police. So that's the context for today's discussion. I want to thank Talib Hudson for doing so much of the groundwork for this event. He's a student at Milano, back there in the corner. And um, I want to thank Jackie Wayans for coordinating things, the, the logistics. Um, as the dean said, we have a number of funders. I won't go through them again. You all saw this um, weird piece of paper that was on your chair. That's not ours. Pinkerton Foundation is, is one of our funders. It has no connection except in deep history to the Pinkerton family, <laughs> just so you know. Um, so this morning we'll be hearing from our opening speaker and then Errol Lewis of New York One will guide us through a discussion with the panel and there will be a chance for you all to pose questions. I want to introduce David Kennedy who's been working on ended, ending violence in inner city neighborhoods for more than 25 years. Last fall, he released his book called Don't Shoot, One Man, A Street Fellowship and the End of Violence in Inner City America, which is over on the table to the side after the program. You can go buy a copy. The book chronicles his work with community leaders, law enforcement, and young people to reduce violence in cities across the U.S. What I find most interesting about Kennedy's work is that he's combined deep interviewing and qualitative research with data mapping and with hardcore data analysis. And out of that, he's developed practical strategies that improve people's lives and create real meaningful change in urban neighborhoods. David. Point kind of morning for me. I work with a guy named John Clofus, who's a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. He gave a presentation at the American Society of Criminology a little while ago, and he said, I don't have any PowerPoint. Um, I, my name's John, and I'm a recovering PowerPoint addict. <laughs> and he, he said he realized he had to give it up when his projector had broken, and he didn't speak to his wife for three days. <laughs> um, so, 
Um, thanks for coming out. It's early. I'm really delighted to see so many people here. I'm, I'm always excited to come to the new school because when I start feeling too old school, I think, where is the opposite of old school? It's here. It's, it's terrific. So, yeah, I've got books over here. I've got this new book out. Um, the book doesn't say anything that hasn't been said elsewhere in more detail and with more precision. It's not an academic book. It is uh, essentially a 320-page rant. And it says fundamentally two things very loudly and over and over and over again. And one is that the country is dealing with what we all ought to regard as a national shame. And that shame can be broken down into two irreducibly linked constituent elements. And it is a national story. It is not just a New York story. Um, but New York is a very interesting lens through which to look at these issues. So as we have just been told, and it's absolutely right, New York represents nationally and internationally the, the national good news on crime. So crime is down dramatically. Whatever one may think about issues with data and, and police recording of statistics and that kind of thing, those, those issues do not apply to dead folk. We are very good at counting bodies. Nobody is cooking the books around homicide in New York. And there is simply no mistaking the fact that New York is a fantastically safer place than it used to be. And it is a place where some of our fellow human beings live fantastically dangerous lives. So if a couple of facts. This city and the country returns over and over and over again, and correctly so, to the attacks on the World Trade Center. And this nation, our government, our polity has changed itself, has redirected itself, has expended enormous gold and blood in response to the World Trade Center attacks. The annual body count for black men 24 and under in this country every single year is about the same as the body count for the World Trade Center attacks. Every year, almost 3,000 people. And while we change our laws and redirect our military and do everything that we do to prevent another World Trade Center attack. That fact, the everyday death count in our poor black neighborhoods gets almost no attention. There's been lots of talk about terror in the presidential campaign. I haven't heard a word about this other thing. And even those of us who are close to this miss the point sometimes. So in 2010, there was a small increase in New York City's homicide total. And it got a lot of attention because it was the first time since 1992, if I'm remembering my, my numbers correctly, that the, the city's homicide count hadn't decreased. It came down enormously quickly and, and dramatically at the beginning of that time. It's been smaller increments since, but it has been edging down relentlessly since the big decline began. So 2010 was noticeable. It, it ticked up. And a lot of people, myself included, when my phone rang and journalists were saying, what does this mean? Is it Armageddon? Are the bad old days coming back? I said, a lot, along with a lot of my professional peers, no, it's not. Um, 
there's no reason to think that there's there's going to be a return to the days of 2,400 dead people in, in New York every year. And three months later, about this time in 2011, the Wall Street Journal published a story which was a deconstruction of that small increase. And it is, as it always is, a tale of two cities. So what happened in 2010 was that white folks got safer in New York City. And if, if you were white, your risk of homicide victimization went down an additional 25% over the previous year. If you were black and male, it went up a full third. So the entire increase in homicide in New York was young black men. And in 2010, black men between age 20 and 30 were 3% of the city's population and 30% of the city's debt. And this is how it works. The nation's homicide risk, homicide rate rather, is edged down to about four per 100,000. So four, four dead people per 100,000 people in the population, the way criminologists and statisticians track this stuff. My friend John Clofus, uh, the recovering PowerPoint addict, has done work in Rochester that says if you are in the, the arc of dangerous neighborhoods around downtown Rochester, they call it the Crescent in Rochester, and they, they have street drug and violence problems as bad as anything I've ever seen outside a big city. If you are an 18 or 19 year old black man in the Crescent, your homicide risk every year in Rochester, New York is 520 per 100 which means if you just do the long division, one in 200 of you, more than one in 200, are being killed every single year in those neighborhoods. So we ought to be ashamed of this. It ought to be one of our biggest national priorities. It is unconscionable what is going on. And it is nowhere near the top of our policy agenda except for some folk who are working on this relentlessly. Um, I said there were two closely linked problems. So that's one of them. The second is what I will call the unintended consequences of what we are doing about this problem. And that is the, the fallout for these neighborhoods of our standard criminal justice policies. So this has become a country where because of our criminal justice response to this issue and related things, especially drug issues, this fine country of ours has become a place where if you are born black and male today, your lifetime chance of spending a felony prison term is one in three. One in three black men will go to prison. One in nine are locked up in the country right now. And in the neighborhoods where the violence is highest and in, in some instances, entire cities being stopped, going to jail, going to prison, ending up with a criminal record has become a normal part of your life. So. There's, there are new estimates of this issue for Washington, D.C., again, our fine nation's capital, where the statistics now indicate that if you are a black man in Washington, D.C., your lifetime chance of being locked up and going to jail is 100%. Everybody spends at least some time in jail. And in places like Baltimore, where they've done the special analysis that lets you unpack this, when they did this 10 years ago, and it's going to be worse now, but these are the, the most recent data we have, if you were then a black man between 20 and 30, on any given day, half of you were under court supervision. You were in prison, in jail, on parole, or on probation. Half of all young black men. 
And that, too, is unconscionable. I, mean, I don't want to live in an America where either one of those things are true. And the normal dialogue we've had on crime for the longest time has focused on one or the other. It has said there's too much crime and so we need to jack criminal justice up. Or if you're on the criminal justice reform side, it has said there are too many people in prison, we've got to change things so that that's not true. Almost nobody has focused on the fact that both of these things are unacceptable. That if you live in these neighborhoods, you have every right to stay alive and not become a victim of homicide. And you have every right to live a life where it is not a routine part of being a man that you will go to prison. All right, we, we need to fix both of these things. And the good news on this, and so this is, <laughs> I've just given you half of the content of my book. Um, the other half is that we now know some things to do that actually fix both of these things. We are not acting like it. It is not well understood that it is true, but the case the book makes, and it is amply validated by field experience and formal research. And, fancy evaluations and all that kind of thing. But the bottom line is that there has emerged a way of approaching this issue that gets us where we want on both sides. It stops the violence or dramatically reduces it, and it stops incarceration or dramatically reduces it in ways that actually strengthen the communities involved and reset what ought to be very important relationships between these neighborhoods and law enforcement. It is within our reach to do these things. And this is a New York City conversation to a considerable extent. So let me tell you a New York City story. So Joanne Jaffe is the head of the New York City Housing Police. And a couple of years ago, she decided to take on what was then a explosively growing problem. A couple of weeks ago, Governor Cuomo made an announcement that in six cities, or rather in four cities, including three sites within New York City, with my help and that of my colleague Tracy Mears at Yale Law School, this family of work was going to be brought to New York in cities and neighborhoods of very high levels of gun violence. So one of those operations, which will be deployed here in the city in Brooklyn, Harlem, and the Bronx, involves sitting down with parolees coming back into neighborhoods. So we look at their criminal histories, and if they have a record of gun violence, they are required as a condition of their release to attend a one-hour meeting. In that meeting, the U.S. Attorney for the area tells them, you are coming out of prison, that means you're a felon. That means depending on your record, if you are caught with a gun again, you face at least a five year and up to a 15 year and possibly more mandatory minimum for gun possession. That is the federal law. We need you to know that you are facing that exposure. They are offered access to social services and they are spoken to by an older, wiser ex-offender who has been where they are and has turned their life around and says to them, I was you, I did it, you can too, and here's what it takes. And then they're sent home. The meeting lasts an hour. There is no follow-up. There is no additional law enforcement. Nobody makes sure that they access the social services. Nobody calls them up. Nobody follows them around. It's the meeting, that's it. And the research on this says that if you are a gun felon and you come back into these dangerous neighborhoods in Chicago where this was piloted, if you don't go to one of these meetings five years out, essentially half of you are back in prison. Okay. Sort of standard recidivism, recidivism expectations for these, these sorts of guys. If you go to the meeting five years out, about 95% of you are still on the street. 
it's unbelievable, but it's real, right? They've actually, this is a proper evaluation. They've done random assignment. We know that this is true. One hour. There are versions of this that have been deployed around gang violence, that are for versions that have been deployed around drug markets. The book goes into all of these. They are alike in that they are all ridiculously effective. And they've been tried for 15 years. They've been tried all over the country. They travel, they exist, they operate within existing resources. And they all have this quality of being fantastically, ridiculously powerful. So much so that part of the history of this work is that nobody could believe it was real. It just doesn't make any sense that, that, that you could do this, that you could have a one hour meeting with guys who are already serious seasoned offenders and five years out this is still changing their life. And so a lot of the history of this work has been figuring out why, why that's true. And some of it's technique, right? So some of it's science. It was about understanding that the guys driving this violence, even in the hottest neighborhoods, are nearly non-existent, by which I mean it turns out that in the most dangerous neighborhoods, it's about 5% of the young adult men who are in, in the street scene that generates the violence. And of that 5%, it's maybe 10% that are really driving things. So that it turns out that if you go to any city's hottest neighborhoods, it can literally be a handful of people that are doing this. And, and in cities that have serious violent crime problems, on a citywide basis, it will be under 3 tenths of a percent of the population. Right, and so those are people you can identify, you can engage with them in various ways. There are ways of enhancing deterrence, there are ways of focusing social services, there are all, all, the, all this stuff that for the longest time people like me were focused on as matters of, as we would say in, in the social science, you know, the, the design of the intervention. But that's not the point. Right? The point has turned out to be much simpler and much more profound than that. And I'm going to sketch that, and that will be pretty much my remarks for the day, because this, this turns out to be <coughs> the whole game. And that is that, as a practical matter, you can imagine three communities that are fundamentally engaged in, in everything we're talking about, the killing, the dying, the going to jail, the being held hostage in their homes, all of it. And those are law enforcement, particularly the police. They are what we usually mean when we say the community, by which we mean the good people in these neighborhoods. And they are the street guys. So this violence comes overwhelmingly out of what we might call gang members, people in drug, drug crews, people active in street drug markets, all that kind of thing. This is overwhelmingly concentrated among uh, very serious chronic offenders. And what you, you learn, so in the introduction you were told, um, I, I did ethnography, I did qualitative research. Well, yeah, great. I, I hang out a lot, <laughs> that's what I do. And ethnographers will tell you that ethnography is a fancy word for hanging out. Um, and if you hang out long enough in all of these worlds, and almost nobody does, which is part of our problem. Um, people know the police, or they know the streets, or they know the community. Hardly anybody really saturate themselves in all three. And not by intent, but by very good fortune, the way I've done my work, it's turned out that I've done all of those things. And what you discover about each of them is that they Nobody wants to walk out their front door and risk getting shot. Even the most serious street guys, they may want all kinds of things and they may not want to live a straight life and they may want to make money on the street, but they do not want to get killed. And in, in the neighborhood where Tracy did this one hour meeting work in Chicago, 
We've subsequently done analysis. And in West Garfield Park, which was at the time the most dangerous neighborhood in Chicago, if you were in the, the network of about 1,500 gang members and drug dealers that were driving things in West Garfield Park, so we've had some numbers, I said four per 100,000 for our national homicide risk, 520 per 100,000 if you're a young black man in, in uh, the Crescent in Rochester. If you were in that network of 1,500 people in West Garfield Park, your annual homicide victimization risk was 3,000 per 100,000. We have families that are sending their kids to Iraq because it's safer. And even the guys on the street don't want to live like that. The community hates what's going on. They are losing their kids either to the grave or to prison. They are scared of their kids. They're scared to go outside. And they're scared of the cops. Because in many of our cities, the way we deal with this is to lock the entire neighborhood down. And so they hate both the problem and they hate what we are doing to them in the name of solving the problem. And in many of these places, essentially all of the men have criminal records because that's what we've done in the name of protecting them, which means they will never work again. They will, they're far less likely to be married. If, if you don't have a locked up parent, 4% of you will be suspended from school. If you have a locked up parent, 25% of you will be suspended school, that the ripple effects of mass incarceration are horrific. And a lot of what we're seeing in these neighborhoods now are a product of what we have done through criminal justice. It is destroying the social fabric of these neighborhoods, and they don't like it. And if you know cops, you know good cops, and most cops are good cops, they hate what's going on. They know it's not working. They don't like being hated. Um, they came on the job especially to try to help people in desperate conditions. Um, they know that they are not succeeding. They know that they're making people angry. They are doing the best they can and it's not good enough. And unless you saturate yourself in these worlds, you don't know that, right? So the, the thing that is the most tragic is that if you're in any one of those communities, you look across the divide and your story about the other side is very different. So if you're a cop, you think the guys on the corner are sociopaths. If you're a cop, you look at the neighborhood and you say, we've got 5,000 people marching on City Hall if a cop kills a kid, but the kids are killing each other every day and nobody says a word, they don't care, they're corrupt, there's no backbone less than the neighborhood. And that's wrong. They're not sociopaths. There is enormous strength and resilience in the neighborhood. But appearances do not seem to communicate that, it communicates something very different. If you are in the neighborhood and you're being stopped and abused and all the men are going to prison and people are still getting killed every day locked up in droves, you do not look at the cops and say, I know you're doing your best and it's not working very well, but we really appreciate all of your good efforts. You know, Thank you very much for what you're doing on our behalf. That's not what you say. You say all kinds of other things. And the, the strongest version of this is it's all on purpose. Right? So many, many, many folks who are not hip deep in this have been enlightened by Michelle Alexander's book. I commend to everybody. And it makes in, in very, very precise and careful and lawyerly language the argument that many, many people in these neighborhoods believe, which is all of this is on purpose. It is an extension of historic oppression and slavery and Jim Crow and everything else by new mechanisms. And after 1968 and formal civil rights, the rest of us, needed some way to continue that oppression by other means, and we came up with it. 
and what the police are doing now is that thing. And I agree with everything Michelle's got to say, except that it's deliberate. It's not. I tell people it's not a conspiracy, it's a train wreck. And if you go to the people who are doing this work every day, they are killing themselves to try to protect these neighborhoods. They're not racist conspirators. It doesn't mean that what they're doing isn't fantastically damaging, because it is, but it's not deliberate. And because all those things are true, because the streets don't like it, the neighborhoods don't <laughs> like it, the cops don't like it, it turns out that this opens the door to what turned out to be fantastically, not only effective, but transformative pieces of work in this area. So this is why what Joanne Jaffe did works. It's why what Tracy does works. It's why when we sit down with drug dealers, with their mothers and community members and say, we care about you, but you have to stop standing on the corner and dealing drugs, almost everybody does. Because what we don't see in our history, in our narratives, in the stories we tell, in our understandings about these issues, we don't see a partial but fantastically important area of common ground. And that piece of common ground, and it's not everything, right? So I will not for a moment pretend that you can sit down angry neighborhoods and law enforcement and drug dealers and walk out the door agreeing on everything. You can't. But you can agree on the following. You can agree that people need to put their guns down, that the killing has to stop, that if people are going to continue hustling, that they need to hustle in a way that is discreet and doesn't destroy the community. So if you're going to deal drugs, deal it with beepers and bicycles and not by standing on elderly residents' front lawns and flagging down cars, that community standards saying these are the things we do here and these are the things we do not do here are both more powerful and more desirable than the arm of the state, that if those community standards will take the role of an intrusive policing and incarceration are now playing, that that is to everybody's benefit, that even the most seasoned offenders and the apparently most unreachable offenders should get help if they will take it, that they should not be walled off from civil society, and that there are a few people who have to go. Right? So if you hang out with the 5%, you will discover that 5% have about 5% of their own of whom they are scared to death. There are not a lot of sociopaths and genuinely crazy people out there, but there are a few, and they need to be corralled, and even their own folks agree with that. And those five or six things I just said turn out to be enough to build an entirely new approach to crime and punishment in the United States. You find the 5%, you find their mothers and grandmothers, you find the elders in the community that they respect. You sit down with them face to face, you deal with them with respect, you offer them help, you offer a safe way in which their own community can set standards. And when they don't listen to all of that, then there's still law enforcement. And it works. It's partial, it's not everything. I take a lot of heat for saying this is really about the violence and the public chaos and not about everything else. People say to me, that's not good enough. You're, you're allowing drug dealing. You're allowing drug use. It's, you, know, you have to go further. To which I say, and this will be my last remark, there are many, many, many neighborhoods in this great country of ours where there are groups of young men running around and they are committing crimes and they are doing bad things and we would, in the best of all worlds, prefer that they not do them. But nobody's getting hurt and nobody's getting killed and you can use the parks and you can go outside and you can walk to school without getting harassed. And those young men are selling and using lots of drugs. But again, nobody's getting killed and everybody feels safe. And the technical name for those neighborhoods is the suburbs. And it is 
now within our reach as a matter of fact, right? So this is the main point of the book, that this is not aspirational, it is not a notion, it is not we should try this. This is working all across the country. It brings the body count down, it brings the jail count down, it resets relationships between law enforcement and these desperately needy communities. We can do this. And the gravity of these issues is such that if we can, we should. The host of Inside City Hall on New York One every evening and um, former longtime columnist at the Daily News and a recovering political candidate and nonprofit executive director and all that jazz. Errol, actually, why don't you stand here? Um, David, you got that first seat. Sorry. Good morning. We are going to have a, a great conversation, and I thank you for being here to take part in it. Um, I had uh, not heard David Kennedy speak lately, and uh, it was wonderful to hear him. Um, there's, there's a lot to get to, and I want to get to it right away. Um, what I'll do is um, introduce the panelists and uh, ask a couple of questions uh, of each of them, really the same question to all of them. Um, and uh, we'll talk for a while, and then we'll leave as much time as possible for you to join our conversation. For those who didn't get uh, the little slip of paper, um, I'll just introduce uh, the uh, folks very briefly. David Kennedy, you just heard of. He is the director of the Center for Crime Prevention and, and Control at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and he's the author of the book that will be on sale afterwards. I intend to get a copy. I urge you all to do the same. Um, Melissa Mark Viverito is uh, the council member, city council member from District 8, which includes um, East Harlem, Manhattan Valley, and Mott Haven. Uh, she also has um, done a report. Uh, she, her task force uh, findings are, are out front, and I urge you to grab that if you haven't seen it. There's also a website where you can, where you can pick that up. Um, Aisha Sekou is here. And she is, I haven't met these folks before, I only know them by reputation. She's the uh, founder and CEO of Street Corner Resources. She's all the way on the end there. And they are a nonprofit. They're doing some uh, work in East Harlem that has gotten a lot of attention. And um, I'm interested in that, um, not only because my parents grew up there, but because uh, it's important work that uh, may be transferable to uh, other communities around the city. And we'll, we'll find that out uh, in short order. I apologize for not having my notes all in order. Kevin O'Connor is an assistant commissioner in the Division of Community Affairs at the NYPD. Very good to see you. And Rayanne Charles is from my neighborhood out in Crown Heights. And uh, they are uh, doing wonderful work. It's uh, SOS Crown Heights, and she's with um, the youth uh, organization that is connected with it. And um, uh, I've had them on the show a few times. I've talked with them a few times. I've, I sort of have been following this. Um, for quite a while and have come out to some of their marches. I understand there's going to be one tonight, as a matter of fact, and um, that is needed. Um, let, me, let me ask you, uh, David, just to get uh, things started. Um, I, I have a very specific question for you, and then I have one for the, for the entire panel, of the remainder of the panel. Um, you, you talked about the three groups that are not communicating with each other, um, the, the, the cops, the kids on the corner, and the rest of the community. Um, you made a, a passionate argument that they all have something in common, which is that nobody likes being locked into the current situation. Why is it in our current discourse, what we see in the newspaper, the, what goes on at the public hearings, um, why aren't we acting that way? Why aren't we acting, uh, what, what accounts for the just utter lack of communication between uh, those, those three parties? Um, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have been to the meetings where these, these issues get raised and aired. 
And I've never seen a single one of them that actually got anything done or went anywhere. People, people walk in angry, they shout at each other, they, they put their various markers down. There is no serious conversation and uh, many of the parties involved can't actually say the things they're thinking because it's too impolite. And some of the parties involved aren't even represented. Right? So I've been to a lot of these meetings. Um, I'll, I'll just say it again, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to spend time over decades with, with all of these three groups. The, the community says the same thing in the meetings that they say outside the meetings. Right, so the community says, why aren't you doing your job? Why are our young men getting killed? Why are the wrong young men getting stopped on the street? You could stop this if you want to. The CIA invented crack, all that kind of stuff. And the cops sit there and listen and roll their eyes and they don't hear a single word of it because they know why they're doing what they're doing. They know that they're not running the drugs in. And what they don't say is, this is sheer lunacy, right? Because that's what they think. They think this is crazy. You, you are crazy. That's what they think. They don't hear a single, single bit of it. Um, they do not say what is on their mind. So what they're thinking privately is they're your sons. What are you doing about it? You know, you're, 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 you're saying that this is our job, but we're not raising them. We're not setting standards for your neighborhood. And that is so fantastically impolitic that they never say it out loud. And the guys on the corner aren't there at all. Right? Everybody's speaking for them, but nobody's listening to them. And they won't allow themselves to say what's on their mind unless the doors are closed and none of their friends are there. Right? So you get these guys on the corner and they say, I don't mind dying, I don't mind going to prison. They are lying. They do not want to die, they do not want to go to prison but the rules of their world say that you have to act like that. And the cops believe them. I mean, this is one of the greatest tragedies in all of this, that the cops will say to you, they're, they're crazy, they are sociopaths. They'll tell you to your face, they don't care about living, they don't care about going to, to jail. And I say to them, look, they run when you try to catch them. Um, they throw the dope away while they're running. If you do catch them, they hire defense attorneys. They flip on their friends. Um, they scream for their mother when they're shot and they look both ways before they cross the street. They, they do not want to die, they do not want to go to prison, but they will tell you they do. And those are stories that it takes real effort to get past. And you can do it, but you can't do it in a big public meeting where everybody gets together once every six months and screams at each other. Okay, fair enough. Um, and with that, in fact, let me uh, say something that I um, say whenever I moderate one of these panels is we're look because we're looking for solutions and because we're all New Yorkers and we all want uh, the best for our city, I'm going to um, specifically ask every panelist to not necessarily speak as a representative of your organization or your point of view. I mean, say what's on your mind. You know, it's, it's, um, you are more than just the title on your business card. And, um, we all have a lot of different experiences. In my own case, for example, my father was a police officer, NYPD, for over 30 years. Um, my, he ran the 7-3 uh, precinct for a while. My uh, sister was a detective and ended up working in IAB, Internal Affairs, where she sort of tried to counsel cops about how not to be bad cops, that sort of a thing. She also spent some time as a street detective in the sex crimes unit in the Bronx. Um, I live in the house my father bought in the 1950s, which it hap happens to be in the middle of the 7-7 precinct in a place that has been very, very, very dangerous in the 25 odd years that I've lived there. Um, and it has gotten fantastically better, um, not, not just statistically, I can tell you anecdotally, you know, the days of walking to Bedford Avenue and seeing a dead body in the street on the way to the subway have been over for a long time and thank God for that. Um, but with, with having, having uh, suggested now that that we all just talk just just let's 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 hear what, what, what you think I want to ask and we can just go right down the panel I'd like everybody to identify what's the the one initiative that you think really needs a lot more attention that uh, that gets to the the, the core of, of combating youth violence we know there are a lot of different things there's midnight basketball there's community centers 
there's different versions of the ceasefire model that David uh, uh, outlined. What's, what's the one that you wish everybody knew more about? What's the one that you wish could get a lot more attention, maybe some more resources? Let's start with you, Councilwoman. Well, thank you for uh, the invite. And I know that uh, there are a lot of service providers here from my district that I see, and I know that we have some high school students, so it's nice to see that as well from, from the district. And uh, I just want to touch on, I think what you know, Mr. Kennedy lays out is really you know, basic. And I think it's really a shame that we don't really seem to be implementing that strategy here in New York. I think that in New York City, there seems to be a real intransigence, right, to, to approaching common sense, uh, a challenge that we have in this city. I think we are all too quick to try to find like the silver bullet solution, like a one size fits all kind of model. And life is much more complex than that. And I think that although it's common sense what is being laid out, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of effort, you know? But I think at the end of the day, what is being talk talked about here is being recommitted to building community. That's what we have to do, is like putting resources to build community, to have all of these entities speaking to each other that the policies that are being implemented, if they're gonna be effective policies, we need to involve the voices of those that are being impacted. And that's not happening, and I think that that's what's you know, laid out. I know that we hear about it all the time, but I think when you talk about going back to community policing, you know, is one element of this conversation as well. Um, we, we're seeing policies that continue to alienate communities, you know, cops in the cars doing patrols, they're not interacting with the community the way they are, the, you know, creating the us versus them mentality between the community and the police and the police and the community. So I think that what's been presented here is, is really reaching people on an individual level and saying, you have the ability to make a change and you have an ability to help solve the problem. And I think giving people that sense of, of you know, ownership and control I think is important. Being able to go to a young person and say, you know, you can be part of this solution as, as Chief Jaffe as he was laid out, which I was not aware of that strategy, which is very surprising and I'd like to learn more about it, uh, of being able to reach people where they're at. And, you know, I'll just, the last thing I say, you know, I'm not, I'm an elected official, but I am a community member. I am deeply passionate and committed to social justice and to equity and to you know, really being concerned about public policies that are ineffective and that are alienating major uh, sectors of our community and our city. And I think that I really am committed as the platform that we have worked on to finding solutions, community-based solutions, to the challenges that we, we face. And we have to do that jointly. Um, I believe that um, we need more youth programs simply because a lot of youths um, they are numb to the fact that gun violence is a problem and like when you're not educated about something you don't care um, just like when everybody used to, use, um, used to smoke cigarettes nobody never used to care about getting sick or lung cancer or any of that but like as it's um, see more of these advertisements and stuff that it is bad, then everybody don't want to smoke cigarettes no more. But like when you see more of these youth programs and you start to get more like experience and understanding of gun violence, then you understand more. I think the council member hits it right on the head. We need to go back to the community policing form of police work. There's a major disconnect between the police and the communities. I spent the last six years as a lieutenant in Harlem. I was fortunate from Police Commissioner Kelly to get a new assignment as the Assistant Commissioner of Community Affairs, ahead of a new Juvenile Justice Division, to try to take what we did in Harlem citywide. What did that mean? There are quite a few people in this audience that I work with collectively on an everyday basis, whether it comes to getting youth programs open, supporting the programs that they're running themselves, or communicating when someone is shot or killed. Finding a common denominator. I'm a father of six children. I want the same thing every parent wants of their child, a safe life and a productive life so that they can grow up and give me grandkids. I have five daughters. I'm planning on having a lot of grandkids. <laughs> you see me shaking my head so you know my pain. <laughs> But it's finding that common denominator that has enabled me in 25 years to build relationships with people that I know, like David men uh, mentioned, are immersed 
in these programs. You have to get personal. And as police officers, sometimes we don't get personal because it's too hard. When I see a dead teenager on the street, which I've seen too many, I think of my own kids. It doesn't matter whether they look, at, look like them or not, I just look at the age. And then I have to deal with the parents and try to explain to them why their son or daughter is dead. There were five teenagers shot last night in New York City. I think that's enough common ground for us to talk about that we can build the bridges to do this. Thursday night I was invited with my officers from Community Affairs to participate in a walkthrough of the Soundview houses. An eight-year-old boy was shot in the shoulder last week by a 15-year-old kid that was looking to retaliate because his team had a problem with another team. And you didn't hear the word gang out of my mouth because it's a different mentality right now. We also need to educate parents and community-based organizations on what this internet is doing to our society. And this is not something that the police department is exclusively doing. We teach parents how to simply Google your child's name. And it doesn't have to be their government name, as we like to call it in the police department. What do they call them on the street? You may be known as Freckles or Spaz. Try that and see what you come up with. And sometimes it's amazing what you find. But it's getting the education on the social media that's allowing cops to have this bridge with kids to be able to talk about expressions like slipping. Why was he shot? Well, he got caught slipping. What does that mean? Well, why did they put three letters up with the letter K after it? That's what social media is providing us, a window of opportunity to see what's going on in our own kids' lives. And to suddenly get into an auditorium and being able to talk to 250 intermediate school kids and hear a pin drop. That means we're on target. Peace and blessings, family. We have a very serious issue that we have not been telling the truth about. And it's become very sexy, you know, this gun violence thing. There's town halls and forums and stand-ups and sit-ins and sit-downs and, you know, all these talks to our kids and, of course, the books. But we haven't been telling the truth about this issue. We really haven't. And that this issue is an issue that is systemic. It's just a part of a whole lot of other issues that we've allowed to take place, in, particularly in this great city, this so-called great city. When you have young people who have to worry about where they're going to eat, how they're going to get dressed, how they're going to wash up, whether or not their mother's being evicted, we have a problem. When you have young people who we've promoted all of this stuff on television and the internet and how important it is to have an iPod and an iPad and uh, the foam sneakers and you know, very poor kids are standing online in front of the hoop store on 125th Street. We have a problem. When we are watching our, our schools shut down, 14 schools in one community, that's a problem. That fills the spirit of our young people with hopelessness and helplessness. And that kid who may see himself becoming a police officer, the lawyer, the doctor, uh, you know, the engineer, whatever it is, begins to not see that vision anymore. You know, they start out like that. You ask the kid now, you walk down the street, and you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they'll say, oh, I want to be this, I want to be that. By the time they get 13, I want to be down with the uh, TND and LOE. It's a different kind of mindset. The mindset changes. Well, what changed? The spirit of the child changed. So we have to be honest, and I mean, it's great if we have dialogue, and I'm very proud to say that I've worked with a lot of different organizations. Street Corner Resources is involved with a lot of different organizations, including NYPD, including the DA's office, and often I'm sometimes the lone voice that will say the thing that other people won't say. And I'm not proud of that. That's a hard position sometimes. We have to be more willing to say the thing that is stinking and dirty and ugly and not nice 
and begin to take the action to correct those things that cause us to be in this room in the first place. There's nothing pretty about that. You know, we can have all these nice little forums and everybody go back and they write their little paper and they say, this is where they were today and you know, I was involved and I'm doing something about gun and gang violence. That's nice. So you are. But you go back to your nice house <coughs> with your nice kids and you don't have to worry until it's on your doorstep, until you move into that condo in Harlem and the, the kid is laying dead and you can't get in the building and that's when the folks in Harlem, the new folks, were asking me, well, how long this been going on? <laughs> going on? <laughs> this is two o'clock in the morning and these people been out there for two hours and they can't get in. And you know what I said? Good, good. Because whatever it takes, not just because they're the new folks, the old folks too. Miss Mamie who sat in the window and watched Bubba go bad and talked about him, she need a wake up call too. She need to be locked out of the building and have to cross crime scene tape going to church. So I'm just gonna say this, I'm one, I'm a mother, I have a 34 year old daughter, I am a grandmother, I have a 15 year old grandson and my grandson was here, he lives in Jacksonville, Florida. And he was here uh, during the Christmas holiday. And I've never felt it more, you know, in my own. I mean, I felt it for other mothers, I stood with mothers while, while they looked at the brain matter of their kid on the ground which is a hard thing to do. But when my grandson was here, I could actually feel what, I can't say it's exactly what these mothers feel, but I felt this thing to just hold him and not let him go anywhere. He said, Grandma, I wanna go downstairs and go to the corner store. It was dark, it was December, it was 5, 30, 6 o'clock and it felt like it was in the middle of the night and I had every piece of fear you could think of. You understand, something is wrong with that. He should be able to go to the store. So I don't want to belabor the point. There are many solutions. There are many things that we can do. Uh, we can come up with a plan, many people have. But one thing that we need to do is look at the issues that are connected to gun and gang violence. When a project, I talked with a, a woman uh, in Lincoln Houses yesterday, she asked me if I would call the city council so that they can get cameras. I shouldn't have to call the city council so that they should get, could get cameras. A boy was thrown off the roof there last year and there's gun and gang violence every single damn day and people shooting. The cameras should appear. So what I'm saying is, is we know, we know as we sit in this room what the issues really are. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you. So that means you just bore witness that you know what the problems are we have to begin to truly address them. We are sitting in the seat of academia. We can't figure it out. We have to stop our children from being fed to the gangs because they are homeless. So when the gang members say, yo, you can come and rock with me, and you gotta understand rock with me, you come live with me, but there's something tied to that. So Squeaky goes and live in the blood house. Sooner or later, they passing me the gap and they say, you got to put in some work. What does that mean? You got to take a body, you got to take somebody out because we dress you, we clo you know, feed you, we protect you, we give you a roof, you ain't got to worry, we hold you down. But I'm only 13, sorry son. That's how it goes. When we were in Brooklyn, I was standing next to a kid, they told me he was a general. He was, I'm sure, he was like, I asked, what did it take to be a general? He had to have five bodies. So I, I, I don't mean to, uh, yeah, I do. I mean to shake you. <laughs> but uh, I'm just gonna say that you really already know. And with, wherever you are, with whatever it is that you do, sociologist, PhD, whoever you are in this room, mother, grandmother, student, there is something that you know that you could do that you have not been doing, and just get about the business of doing it. Help with homelessness, help with the spirit of our young people if you can speak to them. Go join up with somebody, put in some work. And that kid you've been watching, stop him and ask him how you can help. Uh, Rayanne, let me ask you a, uh, a question. Um, what, what is the... Um your peers, the people in your age bracket, 
group generally. What, what, what are they thinking these days? What kind of choices are people making? How is the um, violence in Crown Heights and other places, how is it affecting them? How does it sort of make them see what their choices are going to be? Or does it make people want to pull back and maybe sort of uh, reorient themselves? Does it make them want to be possibly a victimizer rather than a victim? What, what kind of choices uh, and, and, and thinking is going on these days? Simply, it was not affected by gun violence. So by being this type of person, like to say, well, I would participate in this or I would do this, like nobody really cares no more, to be honest. Like, None of them cares no more. All they study to do is get fast money, drink, smoke. Nobody talk about their future. All they talk about is getting a part-time job and go to school. After high school, what is their plans? They don't know. All they wanna get is street credit. None of them is like looking for a better future. And every time, I remember I attended a party like I could see in February, and it was 12 o'clock, and all I see was like 10 cops came down, and I was like, what is the problem? There was like, nobody cannot move. I was like, why not? There was like, because somebody was shot and killed in front. I was like, wow. So we had to stand there like four hours in the cold, being questioned, like why would you have to go to a party with teens, just to enjoy yourself. And you have to stand in the cold, wondering like, why this person was shot and killed? Who shot and killed this person? Like, why did this incident happen? Like, nobody cares no more. Um, for, for, uh, for the entire panel, you know, jump, jump in and we can make this a conversation. Um, there's a point where you have to sort of um, get, uh, well, a meeting between, I'm gonna use David Kennedy's terms since we all heard them this morning. Informal social controls, you know, what the, the mayor of the block or the grandmother of the block or uh, friends and family and uh, classmates can, can do to sort of help influence people, even teachers from time to time. Um, and, and then there's the formal control. There's the cops, and the cops are there. They're just a fact of life. They're not going to pull back. They're not going anywhere. I mean, if you haven't heard uh, Ray Kelly and the mayor on this subject, they could not have been more clear. They are going to continue with stop and frisk. They are going to, and that's going to be for at least, what, another 18 months, it, it seems, um, barring some kind of uh, intervention, possibly from the courts or something else. So how, how, do you, how do you get a meeting or an articulation or some kind of conversation between the informal controls that uh, David Kennedy and others, and I think we all know, really do work, if, if they're done right, and the 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 formal policing that, that's laid on top of this, the, the same community. How do, you, how do you make that work? We, go ahead. Go ahead. I think we've already got that model. We may not be able to get to the young person directly as police officers, but we have agencies and people out there that are already dealing with these kids that can build that bridge between us and the youth. We are trying to refocus our energies with this new juvenile justice division on the youth officer which is basically community policing for kids, where that youth officer knows everything that's going on in that community relating to those kids, where that youth officer is now the resource to direct the parent or that kid to the programs that he needs. We mentioned the, the JRA program with Chief Jaffe. Those officers, not only do they go to the houses, but they come with the social services that that child may need, and it doesn't matter what that resource is, as long as we get that child to that resource. What a great concept. But that should be done on a wide scale basis. Right now it's being done in two areas of the city. That should be done on a precinct basis where we know that, that there's a cop in that command that can tell my son or daughter, hey, maybe the school isn't the right thing for you, maybe you need this program instead. We don't have that right now. And that's the goal, is to build that bridge where we can get to those kids. And we already have partners doing that. We have people in street corner resources. We have SNUG. We have the Harlem Children's Zone. We have Children's Aid Society. 
we have the council members in the communities that are already dealing with these parents. And then the last resort is, hey mom, how you doing? And the first question out of the parent is, what do they do now? We're very good at getting that door open. But what happens once that door is open? We need to get them the resources they need. One of the things we did in Harlem, which was amazing, and this is where we get back to the concept of how the kids have set up their own jails in their own communities, because you can't walk from one block to the other because you're gonna cross over somebody else's turf, is we established a youth fair where we simply, the simple concept, set up a table and advertise what your program can do for these kids. We had 84 agencies show up. We did it at the Harlem Armory. We only had 1,500 kids show up. Sounds like a lot, but it's not. When we talked to the kids later on, we found that the reason they, they can't get there is because they were worried about crossing over certain areas. So we had to find another means to do it. We did it on neutral turf. 125th Street in Harlem is neutral turf. Everybody goes shopping there. We had almost 3,000 kids show up. And we were able to put those kids in contact with agencies and programs. And they saw the police running this program for them. That's where we have to get back. You know, in, uh, when uh, Commissioner O'Connor and I have done a, a lot of work together. On the other side of that, though, we've had to uh, meet with uh, Commissioner Kelly. We called a meeting with him, I think it was about a year ago, and when I say we, some community members of the Committee to End uh, Abusive Policing in our communities, uh, we took the testimony of young men from the communities in terms of the stop, frisk, and search, and what that was meaning for them. So while we are working hard to build relationships with and within our community, and not just with NYPD, but with the DA's office, with our political officials, with community members and even business owners, um, we are in a place where we have to have to re-educate some folk. We can't just change it up because we implement a program. I mean, things don't, the mindset does not change because there's a program in place. The mindset changes because people have a different understanding and they're educated. And that needs to happen. And it's not just within the police department, but that's a major place. Because if you terrorize the community with stop, frisk, search, stop, frisk, search against the wall, on the ground, pockets out, hands up, all the time, you have some kids who get that four and five times a week. And I understand some of the stop and frisk. When they told me that they found, first they were worried about the retaliation, they found a gun the other day on a 14-year-old kid, I applauded that. I emailed the inspector and said, wonderful. But at the same time, things have to happen in a way that it is balanced. And so we can stop, frisk, and search these kids so much that they say, F it. They treat me like a gang member. I'm going to go ahead and get down with that because that's how they're treating me. So if you, if you begin to, to breed that mentality, that's who you are, that's what you're doing, we're treating you like that, then that's what you're going to get. So we have to rethink, and that's why I say we have to really be honest about the problem because there's no sugarcoating this because it will bear its ugly head again. So until we say that stop, frisk, and search, and the, the, our, the, the spirit of our kids are being affected, then we can't like just put them in a nice bright gym and expect them to play basketball, and at the end of the night they leave there and it stop, frisk, search, lay on the ground against the wall, hands up, the whole nine all over again. The kids know the nine, now they just do it. You don't even have to say it to them, it's like an exercise. So. That ugly issue that we don't like to address about the stop and frisk has to be addressed because it is affecting the spirit of our kids. I see them coming to school. I'm in a school five days a week. Street Corner Resources is in Harlem Renaissance High School five days a week. I hear it. I hear them run back in the building when they see the police. We have to address that issue. We have to address it. The other thing is, is that I think that um, we all find the time that our young people are getting. And in order to improve relationships, we have to improve the understanding about our young people. Just because they have a hood on does not make every kid a hood long. You follow me? Sometimes I like my hood on. <laughs> my daughter might say I'm a hood long right now for working with kids on the street. But you get the, you get the sense. We have to really uh, build real relationships where I can call O'Connor and I can do this. I call him, I say, O'Connor, this is what happened, you know, blah, 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 this kid, what is going on? What's the policy around this? 
I'll call the inspector in two or three different precincts, and sometimes I call them at one and two o'clock in the morning, it depends on, and sometimes three, depending on what's going on, and I say, why is this happening? And they'll give a response. But we have to have those open kinds of relationships, maybe not call everybody at three o'clock in the morning, but we have to have the dialogue, we have to continue real dialogues, real dialogues, and not be satisfied with what appears to be. But let's look at what it, it really is. And, and really deal with it. So I don't know if I answered the question. I hope I did. I, um, you know, first of all, I, I want to you know thank all the panelists that are here, and it really personally you know breaks my heart, right, when I hear talk about that helplessness and hopelessness, right, that that, that our young people are experiencing, and it's a crisis, and we gotta we gotta deal with it. I, I don't really think, unfortunately, and I know I've been very critical of this administration. I really don't think that there is a genuine interest um, in really getting at the root of the problem. I think there's a real disconnect between what is being said publicly and what is happening on the ground, right? I, I really have a hard time, and I've said this about, you know, reconciling that. You hear the mayor talk about this commitment to uh, all these initiatives under the Young Male Initiative, right? But we're cutting after school programs, mm -hmm. we're cutting child care mm -hmm. slots, we're increasing the number of arrests under stop and frisk, um, and there is just a disconnect between what is genuinely happening and, and what is being said. And, how do we get those two to come together? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the real issue. We don't hear about it. It is about resources. You know, the assistant commissioner is talking about uh, you know all of the wonderful organizations, but you know there's only so much goodwill, right? Because a lot of organizations are operating under extreme hardship, mm -hmm. resources being cut, services being cut. So you know we there's only so much goodwill. There has to be a genuine commitment to really one changing the policies and the strategies, um, but also the commitment to the resources. And that is goes hand in hand. You cannot be effective in, in solving these challenges without that being there. Uh, and we, when we've seen some really devastating cuts to, to a lot of our youth programming and youth employment programs and opportunities that, that gives kids options, right? So uh, I, I, unfortunately, the way that we do it, you know, that's why I try to really use the opportunity of this position to, in those public settings, really challenge the administration and those policies because we have to move the discourse and the mobilizations on the ground you know, have to be there as well. But I, I, I really believe that it's not gonna be until we have a change in administration mm -hmm. and challenge the next administration mm -hmm. to really address these issues and what are you gonna do about it and what is your commitment to it. So uh, you know, I have a little bit more of a pessimistic outlook doesn't stop me from doing what I want to do, but in terms of really seeing a genuine change and commitment uh, from what is in place right now, I'm having a hard time seeing it in the next 18 months, 15 months. We are going to invite the audience to participate. I'm going to ask one more question, so get your thoughts and your questions together, and then we're going to get started on, on, uh, on that. But uh, I wanted to ask uh, you a question, David Kennedy. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's violence that's connected with something that, however distorted and violent and unfortunate it may be, um, has a certain logic to it, right? Whether it's trying to get money through uh, involvement in the drug trade or something like that. And then there's violence um, that is simply interpersonal, right? Um, fighting over a girl or fighting over perceived disrespect or even just sort of becoming part of, you know, one housing complex versus another housing complex. It doesn't necessarily have any logic to it at all. Um, do the, the strategies that you've talked about, do they work in those cases? Because it's one thing to sort of be able to find a defined organization and say, this one's the general, this one's the lieutenant, this is what it's about, this is the corner that they're fighting over. Uh, and the interpersonal stuff, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's in all communities, it's nationwide, let's be clear. Everybody's got problems on a Saturday night. You can go to a rural area, the same thing will happen. But uh, does your analysis hold in those cases too? It had better be, because actually most of the violence is in your second category. Um, very little of any of this um, is about money. It's virtually all Wall Street code stuff. And that's true even for organizations and most of most of these organizations aren't very organized, but even, even the ones that are making money on the street, most of the violence is personal stuff. And it's, it's honor code stuff, and it's 
it's directly connected to some of this other conversation that we've been having in a, in a way that really is heartbreaking. But it, it's very important to, to understand these links. And the, f the first thing I, I think is to understand that there's nothing specially black or drug dealer or any of the rest of that about honor code issues, right? So this is a country where 150 years ago, young white men of privilege and breeding went into the woods at three o'clock in the morning and hacked at each other with big swords by prior arrangement. That's what dueling was, and you know, that, that was what Southern gentlemen did. And they didn't do it because they came from single mother families. They did it because their street code said, if I don't do this, I'm nothing, and their friends were watching. And there's no shortage of, of honor cultures anywhere, right? And the, 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 the link I want to make is that the anger in the community about things like stop and frisk is fueling this because you have two choices when, when you're wronged, right? You can go to the state, you can give it to legitimate, in theory, legitimate institutions, or you can take care of it yourself. And the more, especially young people, uh, and then their communities are angry enough at the way they're being treated by, especially the police, because that's what they see first and foremost, the angrier they are, the less they feel like they can give those issues over and the more they take care of them themselves. That's right. And so you, we're, in, in some of our neighborhoods, we are locked in what, what, once you see it, is this tragic spiral. So you can, you can start on either side, but you start with the cops, right? And the cops stop everything that moves. And, and that makes the good people in these neighborhoods very, very angry. So they don't like the cops. And so your friend's been hurt and you have a choice. You can tell the cops who shot him or you can get a gun and your boys and you can go take care of it yourself. And the less legitimate the police are, the more likely that you're gonna take care of it themselves. That's right. And then we look at these neighborhoods and we say they're all remorseless sociopaths. And we have, we have done this to them and we've done it to ourselves. Okay, folks, we, go ahead. Somebody want to say something? We, we are, we, are um, we have s students with microphones. This is being recorded, folks, so you've got to speak into the microphone. And we'll just go from right to left, left to right. Let's start, get, get the attention of someone with the microphone, if you, and uh, please tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Stephanie Borden. Um, I actually work at the Department of Public Health at a local district public health office. Um, and we focus on Brownsville, Bushwick, Bed-Stuy, and East New York. Um, and I guess my question is more about, from a city agency perspective, how to create interagency collaborations. Because it's clear that NYPD is comfortable working with, or has a history of working with social services. But I think that, I know my office can't, can't have a discussion about a healthy community and promoting physical activity with, we can't have that honest discussion without talking about violence, without talking about um, the fact that how can we promote physical activity when people don't feel safe walking down the street, when people fear for their kid going to the corner store, when you can't use the park because kids are gonna be stopped and frisked or there's drug activity. So I guess, we have our agenda as the Department of Health and kind of approach our local precinct. But is there some movement institutionally within NYPD to kind of reach out to other city agencies to create that synergy at the institutional level? Because it's clear that kind of systemic change is what is necessary. And I think we need both top down and bottom up. Um, but in terms of like thinking about my role in this, just trying to figure out how the city can help support this even when we may be working in a challenging its, um, administration. There are models already out there. Uh, I like to tout the model that's going on right now. It's a collective between the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, NYPD, Scan New York, the Johnson Community Center, 
and an organization called Pro Hoops. And it gets right into what you're talking about. How do we provide a safe environment for the kids to come down and do physical activity? There are offices stationed outside the center that come in periodically so that the kids can see them, that they're there to support them. Uh, it's run by an agency that has professional basketball trainers. It's sponsored by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and it utilizes a community-based organization, Scan New York, who basically run that facility. And that's what we need to do. It has to be a collaboration of agencies, both public and private, um, because the budget cuts. We need to find a better way. And um, the idea is to get kids that maybe normally wouldn't be able to cross that street, like I was talking about. When I walked in there the other day, I saw five different crews playing ball together. And it's because they knew they were okay going into that facility. That's the goal. And all parties were there for the right reason. Over here. Yeah. My question is, my name is Mark Turner. I work at City College in New York. I mean, how much of this is just city folklore and, of course, just social novelty? I mean, it's been said time and time again, you know, there's always been gangs, there's always been drugs, but you didn't want to grow up and be like these people. I grew up in the South Bronx in, in the height of the crack era. You know, and, and you just see these people, you mind your business and went about your way. I mean, social control for my family, going home to my parents' birthplace, St. Anne, Jamaica, and Hendersonville, North Carolina. To go out back and cut the chicken's head off and ring it, and that's dinner. That was social control. To see that where you've come from as a, a generation of people to where your parents have come from, I mean, we were raised old school like that. How much of this is just so, is it just novelty? I mean, you didn't want to be like Scarface. You didn't want to be like the Warriors. We all see those movies. Who cares? Is, is there something, is a disconnect between what these young people understand to be reality and what we're teaching them to be reality? Simple and plain. One, I'm not sure who you directed this to, but you know, we live in a totally different world than these kids. And that's a big part of the problem because the world that has been created for them, it's a whole different language. It's a whole different set of sometimes intricate rules. Um, it, it, it's just a different thing. It's not what you're talking about. We grew up with our parents. I'm old school, I'm 54 years old, okay? I came from a whole different thing, but I have to make myself understand the codes and how these young people think and what is important to them and what is respect to them. And because we, including myself, I have, I'm learning, don't understand that culture, we're thinking, oh, this is just a phase. It's not, it's, it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger as we sit here. Facebook, the internet, all of the social media, when those kids get ready, I don't know where you live, but I live in Harlem. And the general that I talked about came out of Brownsville. But when I was in Brownsville, I just say Brownsville. They got on the phone and started texting. And while we were there marching for the woman who had been shot in her head, that had the 12 kids, I don't know if you remember that a couple of months back, we had a gang member that was walking with us to rally. They text and got another 50, 60, almost 100 kids to come because they wanted that kid that was with us. And that happened in a matter of five, five to 10 minutes. The culture is very different. We have to learn the language. We have to learn what, the, what some of the codes are. If you're going to be in, on the street doing this work, you need to really understand what you're getting involved in. It is much bigger than anything around folklore or just trying to create a rep. It's beyond creating a rep. Believe me. Believe me. And that's why we need everybody, including you, on the ground helping do, to deal with these kids. You talked about... Um when you walk through a neighborhood, you were taken care of by your family. The pressures of the social media are enormous. We, had a, we have kids that are being videotaped by other kids and being broadcasted as snitches, yes, as right. doing it the right way, but it's not their way. Mm -hmm. they, they basically plaster these kids over a Facebook wide scale area, area that right. the good kids are being tortured into getting into. The peer pressure is unbelievable right now because of these internets. If you're not into the internet right now, and you deal with kids, shame on you. You have to get in their world. You'll understand the language. Look at the graffiti out in the neighborhoods. I don't care what neighborhood, I guarantee I can walk less than a block from here and find three letters on a wall and Google it and tell you what that means. Exactly. It's under your noses. Find it, understand it, 
and talk to the kids about it. It builds a bridge of conversation. Over here. Good morning. Um, my name is Abdul Malik. I'm from uh, Fuse, the Families United for Social Educational Development. Also represent uh, brothers and sisters who care. Um, I, was, I took some notes, and I mean, it's a statement and a question I will pose after the statement. Um, we talked about, you spoke, the councilwoman spoke about policy change. Um, to, I fr I'm from the Bronx, I'm a resident of the Bronx, been in the Bronx all my life. And just on the policy level, we know that there's no city councilmen or council persons who, rep who are representatives on the Bronx who sit on committees like safety. Um, who there's only one council person from the Bronx who deals with gun violence, the, uh, the uh, how you say, the uh, Commission Against Gun Violence or whatever it's called, the okay. Committee Against Gun Violence. There's only one council person from the Bronx that sits on that. So you talk about 18 months of change and being critical of you know, the, the current administration, but there's nothing going on in city, in city council other than what we saw a couple of weeks, ago, well, a week ago when you challenged Kelly, when you did have, you know, opportunity to speak on some of the issues to him directly, and he came out and said that stop and frisk and his initiatives will stay in place, that we saw yourself and a couple of, of your colleagues challenge that. Um, what are they gonna do in, in city council for the next 18 months to make some changes? Secondly, um, oh, no, we're gonna, we're gonna leave it at that and let her uh, give you a response on that, thank you. Uh, there has been legislation that is being introduced by some of my colleagues to try to, you know, the thing is in terms of oversight of NYPD, it's, it's very difficult and challenging, we're very limited in what we have the ability to kind of legislate. Um, so there is though some legislation that is being introduced to try to tackle some of these issues that we're facing uh, in terms of requiring officers to carry certain um, ID or make information more readily available to anyone that they stop and frisk. There's like different kind of uh, uh, information out there. And there have been a lot of recommendations that many of us have made, despite what the commissioner wants to say, that we don't have solutions. Yes, we do have solutions. We want to engage in conversations, and there have been many conversations. They're just not listening. So to the extent that we can legislate, we're looking at those options right now, some of us are. Um, but again, a lot of it comes from policy and administrative changes that has to be come from either the mayor or from the commissioner himself. And that, that is me, that's why I'm saying I'm really not seeing a lot of that. And that's my personal criticism. I'm not speaking on behalf of the whole council, um, although I know many others share the same position. Can I, can I ask you something? Watching that, um, that interchange you had with the commissioner the other day, it seemed to perfectly play out what David Kennedy was talking about before, that you can, you can get a conversation going, but you generally can't do it when the cameras are rolling, that you can't do it in public. Um, have you found that to be the case uh, at, at, at your district level, dealing with the, the precinct commanders and others? I, I will say that you know, I have a very good, and, and Lieutenant O'Connor was, was one that we worked with as well, um, I have a good working relationship with my precincts. But again, you know, some of the practices that they're implementing locally are ones that are coming from the top down in terms of what they're expected to do and, and, uh, and what, what they're being kind of uh, directed to do. So it's, it's a balancing act, you know, and, but again, I, and I've said this all along, we all want safe communities and we all want to have a good working relationship with those that are in our streets. And I think a lot of times, and we've heard this, we got a call yesterday from someone, you know, that some of the times the officers don't want to implement these practices themselves because they don't think it's effective. Uh, so it's, it's uh, again, it's, it's an administrative issue that we have to really push and, and get changed the mindset of how we approach mm -hmm. public safety. And I think that that's what we're dealing with right now, okay. trying to change the mindset. And council member, can you comment very briefly about the task force you pulled together, the youth task force? Well, I mean, we have, um, you know, we did work, I mean, again, you know, and, and I know he poo-pooed it when we had the exchange last week with the commissioner and we said, you know, there's community-based strategies is, is something that we have to look at. And every community is different and that's where we engaged with young people, asking young people, you know, what do you think you want to see more of in your neighborhood? And it took about a year and a half of pulling together some of the providers who are here, people in the community having conversations, and looking at best practices. You know, we did look at the ceasefire program. You know, we looked at programs happening in uh, LA, which is the Midnight Lights program. It's, it's different from Midnight Basketball. Um, but it's, we, we put that all together and we now are trying to figure out if we can get private resources and working with the DA's office. I've met, you know, with the, the 
registration and figuring out how do we approach it from a real community-based level. And you know, I would I would encourage others to to join in doing that kind of work. You know, throughout throughout the neighborhood. Hello, my name is um, Azure Wilson. I'm a sophomore at Fannie Lou Hamer High School in the Bronx. Um, last year, we had our first annual peace fair, and it was basically because during the spring break, the spring break, a lot of the kids, their family, and friends started just dying from gang violence, and it caused a huge depression in the school. We noticed it, so we had something called Fannie Lou TV, and they started their own thing when they had a peace fair, everybody just come and have different activities to bring back our community. So basically, my question is, do you, any of you have like an intern or would any of you be able to come to our peace fair, our sec second annual peace fair on May 17th, on Thursday? There you go. I'll make you a public promise, I'll be there. Thank you. I'll I'll be there. Yeah. I'll tell you how we rock. We'll bring some young people that also perform as well because we bring the peace. We have a thing called I Am Peace, and young people show their peace through their talent, spoken word, dance, rap, singing, producing, mixing. We'll be there. Thank we'll you. There. Just one thing, and I'm sorry, your first name? Azure brings up a point which I get yelled at by Aisha all the time. How many young people are we listening to? Good morning. Um, my name is Marlon Peterson. I'm, I work with the Center for Court Innovation. I'm proud to have Rianne up there. She's uh, part of the program that we run as well in Crown Heights. My question, though, is um, to Mr. Kennedy. And in, in, in hearing your, your piece about the, um, the threefold approach, to uh, dealing with young people, with people in general who are involved in this sort of lifestyle, understanding certain things, and I'm speaking from the perspective of cultures. You know, there's a culture of um, this thing for police. We have um, just Tr Trayvon Martin, how they're dealing with that. The op you can go, I can name millions of different cases. I don't have my list with me right now. But because of this sort of systemic and generational uh, disdain, alienation for police, how effective probably not effective, you're definitely effective in statistically, but how do you address that sort of culture, not only with people with police, but people who are incarcerated, who also have a disdain for law enforcement incarcerated. How does that model work in uh, people who actually want to sit down and listen to law enforcement, who they may look at as the enemy? It's central, and the, the good news is you can actually make a lot of headway really fast, right? So this, this is a, a factual question. It could be different, but it just turns out that f for reasons that I don't fully understand and I will confess always amaze me, there is a, a willingness, a goodwill on the part of the neighborhoods and the community to, f to, f to forgive. Um, my experience is that the community is far more willing to shift than the official world is. Um, we saw it first with gang members and drug dealers who actually will change their ways very, very quickly. I, I used to say 10 years into this work, I know, we, I know we can control the bad guys, I don't know how to control the good guys because the problem was in City Hall and the police departments, it was not really on the streets once you figured some of this stuff out. But, there is also a willingness on the part of a lot of people in law enforcement to recognize a lot of the things that have been said today. Uh, a lot of them know it themselves. They know this isn't working. They, they know that they're treating people badly. They will say it behind closed doors all the time. And a lot of them are increasingly willing to say it out loud. And it is an amazing thing to see a senior cop, for example, go to a neighborhood and even to go to street guys and say, look, I'm sorry. Um, this has not been working. It's not working for you. I'm going to say out loud what we say behind closed doors is not working for us either. Um, I did not come on the job to lock you up. I especially didn't come on the job to go to t tell your mother that you're dead. 
Um, I hate what's going on too. And if you're willing to do something differently, then we're absolutely willing to do something differently. And these neighborhoods that have been, been damaged literally always, right? Because a lot of these neighborhoods are, are very, very historically damaged African-American neighborhoods that literally for the entire time that their people have been in this country have been being oppressed under color of law. That is their living experience in this country. And they will listen to that man usually and say, where have you been? We'll step up. And I don't know why they do it, but they do. We're on this side. Where's our mic? Um, hi, my name is Octavia Coulson, and I'm also a social at FAMU. I want to ask, do you ever realize that some gangs actually start out as a brotherhood opposed to being violent and stuff, like recent? Like as time go on, it get more violent and violent. But some people actually feel safer with gangs around because they feel like they're actually being protected in a way. Like some gang members, family members feel like they're being protected in a way, like opposed to the cops that. Like one of my friends, her brother was just assaulted by the cops and stuff, and that like some of his friends are in gangs and he feel more safe with them around than opposed to the cops. Mm. <coughs> I hear it every day. I hear it every day. I hear it every day. And this is when you heard me when I began to speak and I said, we have to deal with the things that are not so pretty, that we have to look at how we're feeding the gangs because that's another way of feeding the gangs. That kid felt was assaulted, he felt more comfortable with his friends who are probably banging too. The police, some of them bang, these kids are banging. So we have to look at the honest side of that too. I think that, again, it requires re-education and a voice like yours, and you're, you are not powerless in this situation. If that's your friend, you are in front of your friend, you have an opportunity to speak words on his ears to help change things. So when you have that opportunity, you don't have to embarrass him or anything like that, but you have to talk to him about the decisions that he make. Because he can die at the hands of the police, and he can die at the hands of the gang members. You understand? And then some young people, not some, all, need to know what to do when the police stop them. Because I've stopped to protect young people who, you know, to stand there in protection of them, and then they would say things that would put me in a difficult situation. I walk around right now, Detective Brown, Commissioner Kelly's liaison, gave me a card because I'm getting ready to get arrested because I don't want the kid to get arrested because he's telling the officer you know, some very ugly things, inviting them to his private parts and the whole nine. You cannot do that. And old school, people my age, take it a totally different way, even though some of the language is not meant the same way. You follow me? So all I'm saying to you is, is you have an opportunity to provide leadership for that young person. And, and begin with that young person that you know about maybe what their interaction was with the police too. Because just because they were assaulted, and I'm not, assault is not right, you have to see what led to that. And I'm learning, I'm learning that, that everything is not always as it appears to be. There's kids that I protected and the next week they were shooting somebody, at least one of them. You remember that, right? Right. Okay, so, our, 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 our time is winding down. I wanna take two more questions. We're over on this side now. Good morning, uh, my name is Mark Otto. I'm the assistant principal of the Facing History School. Um, and to be transparent, I'm also a candidate for city council in 2013, so I'm gonna put that out there in case people think something strange afterwards. Um, you know. So, I, I was really excited, Aisha, every time, first of all, every time you speak, I'm like, yes, yes, I feel like I know exactly what you're saying, and I think probably it's because you work with young, ch young children and you're in schools. Um, and I feel like somehow that was still lost today. I just have to put that out there. It seemed like we were talking a lot about outside programs and other things that can happen and no one seemed to really, with the exception of Aisha, talk about why don't we just fix the schools we have as our inside program, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's the everyday program, yeah, that's what we have. It. Forget the extra, let's fund what we have right now and let's stop closing down the schools that are in the communities that are struggling the most and I'm wondering how all of you in your different capacities 
um, can work with schools. Because I know every day we deal with who lost their home, who doesn't have food, who needs an outfit, who doesn't have a shirt, the mom just got beat up, the father's trying to break in our school, right? These are things we're doing every day, but the budgets are getting cut and we're doing it anyway. So how can these organizations from outside come into the schools and help us to continue doing this on a much larger scale? So, Amen. quickly, the NYPD is in every school in New York City, and it's the school safety agents. So one of the things that we do is we talk to, no, but what I'm saying is you're saying how do we help the kids in the schools? We go in and we speak to the agents and basically have them talk to the kids about what we're seeing out on the street. And we build a relationship with the kids through the schools. Is that, you, you're talking about a question on how we can help the schools? I know it's not back and forth, but it's clear, those of us that work in schools, that the agents aren't trained to actually have conversations. No, and the thing is, they, they used to I think, I think it's a good idea, I think in theory, I'm not, I'm not going against you, I think in theory that, that would be great if it worked. It would be great if they were trained, and it would be great if they actually worked with the school leaders together and did something together. Um, right now, unfortunately, unfortunately, it is piecemeal. But one of the things that has to be done too is with the way the schools are set up, principals have rules over their own schools. If a principal wants us to come in, we come in. We will speak to them about any subject that they want us to speak about. They used to use the great program and the dare program. Sometimes that's not the topic the kids want to talk about, and we do get invited on an everyday basis. And we will talk about whatever subjects the kids want to talk about. Sometimes it's stop, question, and frisk. Sometimes it's what to do when you're stopped. Sometimes it's expressing themselves that we don't like to be stopped. So we do do that. And that program is continuing. Um, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that, you know, seeing the schools as a safe space obviously is, is in our interest. And I know that, you know, I have in my district very creative and innovative principles that are building relationships with outside organizations and bringing those resources into the schools as a way of enhancing um, the experience of young people and giving and some cases, you know, some principals may be more creative and outside of the box thinking than others, but also there has to be a willingness on the part of the administration, the Department of you know, Education, to really welcome that kind of thinking. But yes, schools are extremely limited. I mean, and you know, what I've seen some principals having to do with such limited resources uh, is, is sad, you know, that they're struggling to this, to this point. Um, but, but there are uh, some really solid relationships that, that are being uh, established I just want to say real quick, Harlem Renaissance High School is one of those schools where we have that kind of collaboration. It takes a lot of work. Um, we have a team of, along with school safety. We all greet the kids in the morning. Uh, it's not what they were used to doing, but it's what we do now. But I have to say, we also have to recognize that police in schools and a lot of other schools have been the pipeline to prison, especially to the juvenile justice system. And we do have to address that little ugly issue. And that's one of the things when I say that we have to really tell the truth about it, that's a piece of truth that we have to deal with. But while we are working on improving relationships within schools, and like someone said, it, it's a collaborative effort. It's not on, on the part of just NYPD or you know the principal. I mean, again, it's, it's an institutional, right? It's, it's an organizational culture that exists, right? School safety agents are under the NYPD. I mean, they've been merged, right? They've been merged transportation police, you know, housing police all merged under NYPD rubric, and so you know when you have this culture, it's you know it's really hard to kind of separate it, right? So you're bringing that culture into the school setting through the school safety agents, and I, I I'm not trying to you know I'm I'm just being realistic. I'm not trying to bash you know the NYPD, but it is an organizational culture issue which we have to deal with as well because you know we've sought transparency in the city council about the school safety agents. We had to force legislation to get information on how many young people Are were arrested. being arrested. Right. How many young Check people, you know, it through, through the schools, right, through the school safety mm -hmm. agents. And that took a lot of work because the NYPD didn't want that legislation to pass because they don't want that information shared. Um, so it really is, and going back to the question about policy and the things that we attempt to do as a way of getting that information and we being able to analyze it, what are the challenges and how can we improve? That is our job. That is our responsibility. We need to ensure that our, our public policies are effective. Um, and getting the data is one way of doing that. Um, and so uh, I know that Mr. Kennedy's work is based on data, and I'm sure he appreciates that, but we need to be able to see that as a way of, of shifting the paradigm as well. 
this is going to be our last question. Yeah. Uh, I'm a resident of the Lower East Side, and uh, we put together a power partnership because what I see as a big problem is, and this is my question, um, what I see as one of the biggest problems that I find the most heartbreaking is that I sense that it's just as long as you do the next project. You know, if you're going to shoot somebody, if you're going to stab somebody, do the next project. You know, it's us and them. It's our project against any other project. So you go from one project to another. I mean, when I think about um, the, the one in Brownsville, it was, when I read about it, it was two different turfs. It was two different projects. Manhattanville came across the street and did Grant. And it seems like it's okay to do the people across the street. It's those people in that project, they're not our project, so it's okay. And so that's why we form a partnership because we want to try to make it not Turfville, that it's not okay for you to go across the street and shoot somebody. But that, that's my question. What strategies or approaches do you have for that kind of a mindset that it's actually okay to do those other people? It's funny you mentioned Manhattanville and Grant. Um, we have, I have two gentlemen, one was born and raised in Grant, one was born and raised in Manhattan. They're best friends. We're trying to find a way to get them to each bring their development kids to one location. And that's what we're trying to do. If you know there's a beef between two groups, we got to get them to the same table. Whether it's in a small term, um, I'm thinking of Project Snug, where you bring in some of the top shot callers, as they like to call themselves, to the table, or getting them on a basketball court, playing ball together. Getting them to find that common ground that they like. And that's, that's what it needs to be done, but you need to have both sides come to that table to do that. Yeah. And strategically fight at night. They will shoot at night. <laughs> go with them, you'll just be caught up in the matrix. You're but summing will, up what's going around the yeah, city. The, That's what's going on with these kids. Yeah, it is what's going on, but it's not what we have to let go on. One of the things we have to do is when we have an opportunity to speak to young people, and I'm not talking about talk at them, speak to the spirit of the young person. Because behind all of that rah-rah and how bad you are and that rep, there's a kid that was born not like that kid that you see. And so we have to go to the place in that, and we know how to do that, and get an ear, and begin to speak not just to one, but to others, and speak and begin to help them to develop and see that that's not who you are. And that's not what you have to do. There's something that happened, and it was fed, and it grew. And that's why those kids see each other as those people, and not that that could be my brother, cousin, the one I went to Head Start with. These kids, when they meet, either in court or at the morgue when the parents meet or at the precinct, they find out, oh, hey, my son shot your son. They were in Head Start together. We have to speak to the spirit of our children. And so it means that we have to get out in our community. It's not going to be any quick fix, no drink you can pour and serve it to everybody. We have to get in our communities and do the work. We have to put pressure on the politicians to drive certain things to happen, to make certain things happen. We have to have conversations with Commissioner Kelly, NYPD, and have real conversations and say, we need this fixed. If this is the only way you could do police work is to have everybody stop, frisk, and search, something is wrong with that. They used to infiltrate, why not? You understand there are other things that they have that they can use. We have to push them to use those things so that we create better community. We have to do, like uh, Commissioner O'Connor said, we have to have basketball and all of those things, but we have to deal with the things that are the real problem. Okay, we that is gonna be the last word. I wanna um, thank you, you have been a great audience, wonderful panel.
Let me give a little plug to uh, Inside City Hall, 7 and 10 p.m. on New York One. I'm going to give you guys a shout out. We've been filming this entire event today. And um, let me turn it back over to Andrew White. Thank you, Errol. Thanks all of you for coming. See you next time. Yeah.